Well, it is great to be here this morning. Gracie and I had a wonderful trip to Word of Life Hungary. And on the way back, we spent a long weekend in London, and we had a great time there. Actually, when we were there, we went to the famous British Museum. And there I saw the Rosetta Stone. And I actually brought the Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone back with me today. It's right here. And if you don't believe it, you can read on the box. It says, the Rosetta Stone. And for all of you Greek scholars, you can come up afterwards. You can take a look at it. And by reading one level, you can then interpret as a key uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and another Egyptian language. So I will just leave that here for you so that those of you who'd like to uh, read it after the service, it's right here. You know, that's a text that might be hard for you. And there's a text this morning in our passage that was a little hard for me. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 27. And in 1 Samuel chapter 27, we continue in the life of David. And this reminds me of a, an account of Winston Churchill one time who was going to give a eulogy for one of his predecessors who was a known appeaser of Hitler. And Churchill showed his manuscript to his wife before he gave the eulogy. And in it he commended his fellow leader. And he said the man had followed his conscience. And he saluted his memory. And he said he was one whom Disraeli would have called an English worthy. And he showed that to his wife. And his wife read it. And she said, that's very good. And Churchill said, well, of course, I could have done it the other way round. In other words, I could have done it completely different also. And when we look at this passage this morning, I preached this passage many years ago. And I have to confess to you, I did it the other way round there. In other words, I commended David. I said David was fighting the Lord's battles in obscurity. And I commended him for what he did. And that's true. He was fighting the Lord's battles, and he was in obscurity. But I also think, though, that he was out of the will of God, that he was reasoning in the flesh, that he had made decisions that he should not have, and there were consequences that followed. So this is a difficult text. You could preach it one way. You could preach it another way. Let's look at it and let's look at it together and let's decide. We're going to observe, we're going to interpret, we're going to apply. What do you think the writer to 1 Samuel is trying to teach us in this passage? Well, let's begin in verse 1. It says, Then David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me any more in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. So that's the first verse. This is an important verse. What do we see in the verse? Well, I think the first thing we see, it says that David said to himself. Now, we could interpret that literally, David said to his heart. We could translate it, he thought to himself. But I think the first thing we see here is he's operating based upon his abilities, his rationale, his understanding. And he seems to be doing that only to himself. In other words, when we look in the life of David, when we see what we've seen in 1 Samuel, we see that David had lots of spiritual resources, but it seems like he doesn't use them here. In other words, David for example, had 600 men with him. And among those men, there was a prophet named Gad. And earlier in the book, God spoke to David through Gad and told him to go to Judah and be safe there. But it doesn't seem like David asked Gad a question. Maybe Gad was gone. Maybe he was on vacation at the British Museum. But I doubt it. I think Gad was probably there, but he doesn't talk to him. Well, what else could we think? Well, remember there was a man named Abiathar who was a high priest who had the breast 
plate and had Urim and Thummim and could have inquired of God. And, and so later in the book, David will ask him and he brings it out and he inquires of God. But in this passage here, he doesn't ask him anything. He doesn't talk to him. In other words, the passage doesn't say that he did wrong, but it certainly omits many things that he could have done right. What it says is that he reasons to himself, that he speaks to himself, and I think he's walking solely according to his own understanding. The passage doesn't even say that he prayed. No mention that he prayed. It just says that he said to himself. And not only that, then what does he come up with? What is his rational results or reasons? What does he say? He says, I will perish one day at the hand of Saul. Now, that's interesting that he would say that. He says, I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. But if you stop and think about it, hadn't God delivered David multiple times from the hand of Saul? I mean, multiple times he delivered him from the hand of Saul, and he delivered him through Jonathan, and he delivered him through Michal, and he delivered him through Samuel, and he delivered him through Abiathar, and he delivered him at the Rock of Escape, and he delivered him all the time. And he says, I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. And not only that, hadn't God made promises to David that he would be king in Israel? I mean, Samuel had anointed David to be king in Israel. So the word of God to David that he was anointed to be king. So how is it that he thinks he's going to perish at the hand of Saul if he's been anointed king? In other words, David essentially is bulletproof because God has said that you will be king through the prophet Samuel. And not only that, Jonathan had encouraged him and said he was going to be king. And not only that, Abigail had told him that he was going to be king. And not only that, even Saul himself had said, you're going to be king. And yet he says, one day I will perish at the hand of Saul. Even though he had the word of God that said he would be king, even though he had the encouragement of those faithful people who said he would be king, even though he had the providential experiences that God had saved him one time after another time after another time. And so then we might even say, so he says, I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. So what's his, so, so what's his, his first conclusion is he's going to perish. So what's his solution? Well, his solution is this. I will escape to the land of the Philistines. Now, that's almost laughable if it wasn't true. In other words, escape to the land of the Philistines? I mean, the Philistines are their arch enemies. How did it work out the last time he went to the land of the Philistines? He had to feign madness to escape with his life. And so he's going to go to Gath of the Philistines. Let's see, that word Gath should ring a bell. Let's see, um, there was some guy from, a tall guy, what was his name? Goliath of Gath. So I'm going to go to Gath because that's where I'm going to be safe. Hmm, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? His own reasonings, he said to himself, I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul and I'm going to escape to the land of the Philistines because I'll be safe there. And David's a man after God's own heart. And yet, can you see, human reasonings here, I think, are leading him astray. And if you remember, the prophet Gad had told him in 1 Samuel 22, verse 5, go to Judah and you'll be safe there. Now, when we say he'll be safe there, that doesn't mean Saul's not going to pursue him because he did pursue him day after day. But God preserved him there. So if God had told him to go to Judah before and God wants him to go somewhere else, You'd think God would tell him, right? But he's reasoning and saying thus to himself that he will go to the land of the Philistines and I will escape. So that's what he does. Well, what do we see in verse 2 and 3? So David arose and crossed over he and the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And again, interesting that he would go there. And David lived with Achish. And the passage says three times that he lived there, lived with Achish or lived with the land of the Philistines. He lived there with Achish 
at Gath, he and his men, each with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And I would say there that when David was reasoning thus to himself, he was probably thinking, oh, I got I to gotta escape. And he's thinking of himself, but he doesn't really think about, I don't think here, I've got 600 men with me. And not only that, I have wives and I have children. So this was quite a group. It could have been a couple thousand people. And they too are going to go with me to the land of the Philistines. And they too are going to have to live there in Gath, the land of the Philistines. And what would it be like to live with the land or in the land of the Philistines? In 1 Corinthians it says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. I don't think living in the land of the Philistines was probably a very edifying place to be. They were idolaters. They were uh, people that were Israel's enemies. I think of Lot. If you remember Lot, Abraham's nephew, when he lived in Sodom, it says, For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. How great would it have been to live in the land of the Philistines, to live in Gath? I'm not sure David thought about that when he decided, I'm going to escape to the land of the Philistines. How would that have been for the men of David to live there? How would it have been for their wives? How would it have been for their children to live in Gath, the land of the Philistines? Then we read in verse 4, Now it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he no longer searched for him. Well, we would have to say that David did experience some relief. And I think sometimes there is relief even when we make a bad decision. But sometimes that relief is short-lived and there are consequences and unforeseen dilemmas down the road that we may not experience or know of yet. So there was a passing relief, but what was the price of that relief? Well, that's what we'll begin to see. Look in verse 5. Then David said to Achish, If now I have found favor in your sight, let them give me a place in one of the cities in the country that I may live there. For why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Well, what was the price? Well, the price that begins to be paid is that David is appealing to Achish. That David is saying that he is the servant of Achish. That David is indebted now to Achish in a sense. That David says that I am your servant. Now, this seems a far cry from chapter 17 when David went out, when David went out to face Goliath, because at that time David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, it seems to me that David is taken a step down. How is God presented? How is the God of all the earth presented? How is the God of Israel presented when his servant has to go to a Philistine king and appeal to him for help? How does that make God look? How do you, what do you think? I don't think it makes him look too good. What do we see in verse 7? The number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. You know, in a sense, that's a pretty long time. A year and four months in a, in a man's life is a pretty long time. He might have thought, you know, I've got to escape. I've got to get out of, out of Judah. I've got to get away from Saul. I've got to get some relief. I'll just go over to Gath for a while. How long is a while? Apparently, I would say a while might be longer than you and I might think. And I think here it was probably longer than he thought. And he was there for a year and four months. What does he do when he's there? Let's look in verse 8. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. For they were the inhabitants of the land from ancient times. As you come to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt... David attacked the land and did not leave a man or a woman alive. 
and he took away the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels, and the clothing. Then he returned and came to Achish. What did he do when he was there? Well, I do think he fought the Lord's battles. These were people who were enemies of Israel. These were people who Joshua and the Israelites had not destroyed earlier when God had told them to do so. So here I do think we'd have to say David is the man after God's own heart and he does want to please God, but I think he's got off track by human reasoning. Well, what happens next? Well, verse 10, I think the price of relief has become a little bit higher. Now Achish said, where have you made a raid today? And David said, against the Negev of Judah. Now, in one sense, that's true. Because the Negev is a southern part of the territory of Judah. And if you just had that, you'd probably think, he made a raid against the Judeans, the Israelites. But that's not what he did. But that's what Achish thought he did. So you might say that David is kind of blurry on the truth there. He said, I made a raid against the Negev of Judah and against the Negev of the Jer... Whatever, the, oh, that's a hard one. And against the Negev of the Kenites... Now, here, it's what they say on TV. They call it dissembling. That means lying. That's what the newscasters talk about. Oh, he dissembled. Well, he lied. And here, I think he's lying. He's painting a picture here that he is, he's attacking Judah. He's not attacking Judah. He's attacking Israel's enemies. He's attacking people who might have been allies of Achish, but he doesn't leave any of them alive so that they might be able to tell Achish. So he says, this is what I did. And David did not leave a man or a woman alive to bring to Gath, saying, otherwise they will tell about us, saying, so has David done and so has been his practice all the time he has lived in the country of the Philistines. So what's the price now? Well, it seems to me that the price now is that David has been forced to live a life of deception and duplicity, that he is no longer being honest. And I think you could question his integrity in what he said. Now, I will grant that sometimes in war, and when Israel is in war, there was the provision for those who were spies, like Rahab the harlot, who could lie, and that was approved by God. I'm not doubting that, but what I'm seeing here as I preach it the other way around, is I think that David put himself in a position based upon his own understanding and reasoning that could have been avoided. But he's looking for relief. And though, so not inquiring of God, he says, relief is in Philistia, and that's where I'm going to go. And when I get there, well, I got to leave that one place because it's so bad. So we go to Ziklag and we go to Ziklag and then I've got to lie even when I'm in Ziklag. Well, verse 12, Achish is impressed. So Achish believed David saying, he has surely made himself odious among his people Israel. Therefore, he will become my servant forever. Achish says, he's my boy now. And you know, David was talented the irony, the, the, the tragedy is if Saul just wouldn't have been overcome with jealousy, he would never have lost a battle because he had the man on his team who was the anointed of the Lord who couldn't lose. But Saul drove him away and he goes into the land of the Philistines. Well, let's just peek into chapter 28 verses 1 and 2 because the story goes on. Now it came about in those days that the Philistines gathered their armed camps for war. Imagine that. The price is going to get even higher for relief in Philistia. And who do you suppose they want to go to war with? Their camps were gathered together to fight against Israel. So Achish said to David, No, assuredly, that you will go out with me in the camp, you and your men. Literally, it says, you must go with me. In other words, so what's the price now? 
The price is a price so high that David will not pay it. But the price would be that he would have to fight with the Philistines against Israel. Do you think David foresaw that when he thought, I got to get out of Judah? Do you think David thought that he would have to call Achish his servant? Do you think he thought he'd have to lie? Do you think he thought that he would be impressed or pressed into service to go to war against Israel? I doubt if he thought that. I think he was just reasoning with himself, thinking to himself, thinking human logic, human understanding. And I'm not saying the Christians should be irrational, but I do think the Christians should say, I've got the Word of God. I've got the leading of the Spirit. I don't have to do this just all in my own strength. David had a prophet. David had a priest who had a Urim and Thummim. He could have inquired of God. He had the promises of God. And what did he do? I think he walked according to the flesh. And I think the price was much higher than he expected. I think that first step down didn't seem so deep. But then he continued and he continued. And so now he's faced with the dilemma, will I go and fight Israel? Well, he has an interesting answer in verse 2. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. In other words, you won't have to hear about it you'll see it. <laughs> it's a pretty vague answer. And in a couple of weeks, we'll see God does deliver him out of this dilemma, but he certainly put himself into the dilemma. And what I'm thinking here and what the application might be here today is, why not try to avoid those dilemmas? so that we don't have to be rescued by the skin of our teeth. He says, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. It's almost like he loves David. In other words, what do you think? I mean, what's David's testimony going to be with this man here in the future? Not very good, I don't think. What would happen to David here? What did David forfeit? I like the companion Bible said, for this little bit of relief, he put himself in a position of falsehood. What else? The people, his people that followed him, it shook their confidence in him. It possibly delayed his ultimate election to be king of Israel. It possibly could have led to fractures in the kingdom in the future. In other words... There were unforeseen consequences that happened to him. And that's what I want us to see here. Because David is a man after God's own heart. David is a believer. I like what Chuck Swindoll said. Chuck Swindoll said sometimes we read about the unbeliever who's, who's overcome by sin. And sometimes we read about the believer who's walking with the Lord and he's in triumph and victory. But sometimes we don't think about what about the true believer sometimes who gets off track, who makes bad decisions, sometimes sinful decisions, and then has consequences and dilemmas as a result of that? That's what we see here. I think in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, the apostle Paul talks to the Corinthians who were believers, and he says, look, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? He says, you folks are carnal, you are fleshly. And he doesn't say that as though that's an acceptable position. That's not an acceptable place to live in, but it's still possible. And so the exhortation is, don't be that way. In Romans chapter 8, verse 4, he says, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And how does the Christian do that? I think the main way the Christian does that is to Use the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. And then what else? Walk according to the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be sensitive to the guidance of the Spirit. You've begun by faith, by the Spirit. Now walk by the Spirit. And that's what I think, and that's why I'm preaching it a different way around, that sure, David did have to flee, and David was in obscurity, and David was still fighting the Lord's battles, I agree. 
but I think he put himself in a position, a compromising position, where he had to do these other things that weren't necessary. Now, that doesn't mean it would have been a, a, a bowl of cherries in Judah. I mean, Saul would still per have pursued him. But David had the promises of God and the protection of God, and I think he would have avoided a whole lot of problems and difficulties. Some of you, maybe your favorite verse is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And what I'm arguing here this morning is it seems to me he was leaning in his own understanding. And that's possible for you and for me. And let's try to say, let me lean on the Word of God. Let me be sensitive to the Spirit of God. Let me pray to God and ask for His guidance. Maybe even ask wise, respected Christian friends, what do you think of this? What do you think about me going to the land of the Philistines and escaping and living happily ever after there? It's almost laughable that he would come to that conclusion. But when we're overwhelmed by circumstances, we are capable of coming up with some pretty, shall I say, laughable conclusions. I am. Maybe you guys never struggle with that. But that's certainly possible. So number one, don't walk in the flesh. Number two, don't be entangled with unbelievers. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have, right, has, have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? In other words, you're going to go to King of Gath, the King of the Philistines, and he's going to be the one to save you? Come on. The Bible says, Do not be bound together. The King James says it quite well. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That could apply, obviously, in a business situation. It could apply in, a, in a, a spiritual situation. That was the problem at Corinth. They were tolerating false teachers. It could apply in a dating relationship, a marriage relationship, any close relationship where you're connected and entangled. He said, don't go there. Because... Your light and their darkness, your righteousness and their lawlessness, avoid that. And then what to do? In Revelation, there's a verse that says, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Remember where you have fallen. Where had David fallen? Well, I would say when he came to the border where it says, you are now leaving Judah and entering Philistia. I think that's where he got off track. And I think he should have gone back to Judah. And that doesn't mean Judah was without problems, but Judah had the smile of God on him there. And I think that's the solution. Go back from where you have fallen the Bible says it so often, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. It says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's the solution? I think the solution is confess and get back on track. Get back on track. You know, I began by saying Churchill said he could have done the eulogy the other way round. And I told you that I could preach this passage the other way round, that David did everything right, but I don't think he did now. But you know, there's one person, you can't preach it any other way round, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, because when he was confronted with death in a cross, what does it say? My soul has become trouble, and what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. He did not flee. He did not escape. What did he say in Gethsemane? He said, Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. He did not flee. He drank the cup. And what was the cup? It was going to the cross and paying the penalty for your sins. And what did he say on the cross? He said, it is finished. And after he said that, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He did not turn back. 
He did not flee. And he paid the price for you and me. In what was God's estimation of God the Son, the one who didn't flee, didn't rely on human reasoning, but the will of God? It says of him, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The one who did not turn back is Lord, and all confess that. And you and I can confess it right now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us not to lean on our own understanding. Help us to look to you. Help us, help us to look to your word. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit. Some decisions are clear, some are more difficult. But guide and lead and bless your people. And if there's one here this morning who's never trusted in Christ, one who's not sure they're forgiven, you can be. And I invite you to trust in Him. I invite you to pray with me right now. Dear God, I have broken Your commandments. I cannot bring about my forgiveness. But I believe Jesus Christ, God the Son, has paid my penalty. I can do nothing but I believe He can do and has done everything. And I trust in Him as my Savior. I trust that He shed His blood to pay my penalty. I trust that He died in my place as the payment for sins. Lord, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. In His name we pray. Amen.